الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين استفاء ما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هل يستوي الذين يعلمون والذين لا يعلمون سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد يوم الدين والسلام The main message I wanted to give you, I already gave it to you yesterday. And I'm happy about that because most of you were here yesterday. And one of your associates was telling me that everybody is still sleeping in their rooms. A lot of work. It's university is on, on a Sunday morning to wake up early. It's difficult for university students. If there's somebody here who was not here yesterday, I make no apologies for that. I have given them the power presentation and you can look at that uh, later. I will be continuing from what I did yesterday. I am going to actually not speak very long and I thought rather than me, because I spoke to you yesterday, rather than lecture you again for another hour and a half, I will speak for a short period of time and then I will open up to you to ask you questions. All right? <coughs> If you remember yesterday we talked about spirituality in Qur'an and we took you through the history of the ruh and the spirit and taqwa and zikr and ikhlas and iman and all of these different relationships that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has with the believers and for each one we showed you a different verse in Qur'an. Today they asked me to speak about knowledge in the Qur'an. So before I begin to show you some verses I want you to understand something very clearly. The Qur'an al-Kareem is about three things. The first is called the wordings of Qur'an, Al-Fadhi-Qur'an. In order to learn Al-Fadhi-Qur'an, number one, you must be literate, you must learn how to read Qur'an. Then you must have verbal literacy, oral literacy, you must be able to recite and pronounce Qur'an correctly. That is called ilm tajweed That is the first level of knowledge of Qur'an, knowing how to recite it, knowing its recitation. Being able and skilled in your recitation, such that at least you don't make any glaring errors and mistakes. Second level of knowledge is called the Ma'ani al-Qur'an, the meanings of those words. But it's not enough to just recite the words, because you won't be able to get guided by the guidance unless you understand the meaning of the words of Qur'an. Now the meanings of Qur'an have multiple levels, multiple levels. There was a great scholar of India, Shah Waliullah Mahadis Dhali Mantala, and he wrote a work on Usul of Tafsir in Arabic called Al Fawzul Kabir. And in Al Fawzul Kabir, he met, and, and, and many interesting things he writes there. One of the things he writes is that there's number one, the superficial, general, standard meaning of the Arabic Quran. So that is something you would think that anybody who is an Arab, but who has at least 10th grade or 12th grade education, they will be able to understand the general meaning of Qur'an. But since all of you are university students, I would ask you to ponder that we study so many texts. I mean, I'm from the United States Social Sciences. If you are from that field, you would know that there's the great books, the great authors. And when you look at these texts, the greater the text, the greater the author, the more depth and meaning. Then you will find commentaries, super commentaries. Let's say you're looking at the collected works of Plato or Aristotle. You will find commentary upon commentary. Why? Because the author is profound. The author is deep. So there are layers and layers of level of meaning. That's why people do entire degrees on this. You can not just a bachelor's, a master's. You can do an entire PhD dissertation on one single work of Aristotle. There are conferences on this. So what do you think? Do you think that Allah Ta'ala's kalam, kalam Allah, is going to be less profound or more profound than kalam al So obviously, if there's depth to the meanings of Aristotelian works, and those depths of meaning require years of dedicated study, they require years of pondering, discussion, analysis, research-based writing, presenting that writing in journals and conferences, So can you imagine the level of depth that exists in the meanings of Qur'an al karim When Allah tells us the most profound, He is Akkum al hakimin the most wise of the wise ones. But, because Allah tells us, and then you'll see that when we come to the slides, Allah tells us put levels of hidayah in Qur'an. Levels of hidayah. There's one basic level which is called Hudan al-Nas. 
in order to get that level of hidayah, you actually don't even need to know the entire knowledge of even the superficial meanings of Qur'an. That's how you will find the vast majority of Muslims in the world today actually don't know the meanings of the entire Qur'an. So how are they being guided, right? Because the knowledge content of Qur'an is something that they know. For example, they know that there's life after death. Now if I ask them, okay, tell me all the verses in Qur'an where Allah has talked about life after death, they don't have that level of understanding of Qur'an. But the purpose of all of those verses was to create an understanding that there is life after death, they have that understanding. If I ask them, that there, is there a Jannah? They say, yes. I say, okay, recite to me all the verses where Allah Ta'ala mentioned Jannah. They don't know that. But they have the basic content of the understanding that there is a Jannah. So there's even actually then one lesser level of knowledge to know the basic core content of Qur'an even though you don't know the entirety of its meanings. Second level is to know the entirety of its meaning but at a 10th or 12th grade level. And then after that comes a big progression to learn at many levels of depth the in-depth meanings of Qur'an. So Allah Ta'ala raised a group of scholars in this ummah. They are called Mufassirun. Mufassirun, the scholars of Tafsir. And they knew the meanings of Qur'an at an incredible level of depth. If you look at the major classical collections of Tafsir, sometimes there's 10 volumes, sometimes 15 volumes, sometimes 20 volumes. If you look in the Western tradition, to produce a work of 20 volumes, that's called an encyclopedia. So you have grown up in the DVD age, but some of your parents may still have these relics on their bookshelf, and there's 20 volumes, and 20 volumes of Encyclopedia Britannica written by three or four hundred professors. And our ulama, one Mufassir of Qur'an, can write 20 volumes. And what is he writing? He's not writing light level prose. He's writing intense, deep analysis and understanding of the greatest work ever produced because it's the greatest book revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if the knowledge of Qur'an can go all the way to that level. So there are levels of knowledge of Qur'an. Clearly then there are levels of knowers of Qur'an. Right. Now, another thing I want to tell you is that, here, if there was a board I would have written for you, understand this, that there's a difference in our deen between knowledge and ideology. There's a difference between knowledge and ideology. This is a very important thing for you to understand. Sadiq Bhai, they put me here, they bring out the professor and... Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, if you can do it, I'll do it on the board. Otherwise, I can, I can just explain it verbally. The women will be under, able to understand it verbally, but the men won't be able to understand unless they use the board. Yeah, that's our experience. Here, <laughs> hmm? I'll explain it verbally. So just pretend there's a board, and on one side I put knowledge, on one side I put ideology. One side I put knowledge, it's okay, it's okay. One side I put ideology. What's the difference between these two things? So there are few key differences between the knowledge-based approach to understanding Islam and the ideology-based approach to understanding Islam. Oh. First difference, first difference is that the ideology-based approach says that you must first understand something before you agree with it. You must first understand something before you agree with it. And the knowledge-based approach says that you must first understand something before you may disagree with it. It's a very subtle difference. I'll say it again. The ideology-based approach says that you must first understand something before you can agree with it. And the knowledge-based approach says that you must first understand something before you disagree with it. So let me give you a very good example in the field of Islamic knowledge, that is Hadith scholarship. So many times I come across people who they don't accept the scholarship of the Hadith scholars. Okay, that itself is not a problem. The question is on what basis don't you accept it? So the academic approach, which is actually what universities follow in the liberal arts, humanities and social sciences, is you can't disagree with something until you've understood it. So the way if I was to put up here on the board, it's called learn, then understand, then appreciate. Learn, then understand, then appreciate, and then you can decide whether you agree or disagree. 
You can't make the decision to disagree until you've learned something, understood it, and appreciated it. And if I was to add the next thing on the board for you, until you've learned it, understood it, and appreciated it on its own terms. You can also appreciate it from your own different paradigm outside of perspective, but you must also appreciate it as it is self-understood on its own terms. And then when you do that, then you, and only then you can make the decision to agree or disagree with it. That's the academic approach, that's called the knowledge-based approach. The ideology-based approach says that no, if you don't understand it, you don't agree with it. So you don't have to learn, you don't have to understand, you don't have to appreciate, you can go straight to the decision, that's called ideology. You go straight to the decision whether you agree or disagree with it. 99% of the people that I've met, and because this is my field of Islamic studies, who make this claim, rather not this claim, they boldly proclaim that they disagree with the classical Hadith scholarship, few questions will quickly reveal they've neither learned it, nor they've understood it, nor they've appreciated it. So I don't accept their disagreement because it has no basis. It's like me saying I disagree with nuclear physics. That's a pure, that you say that's some ideological view you have because neither have you learned it, nor have you understood it, nor have you appreciated it. Now how does ideology approach work when it comes to some scholarship? So sometimes when they want to convince you not to agree with something, so they'll give you a pamphlet. These are what we call pamphleteers, as opposed to solid research. Pamphleteers. So I give you a small 10-page pamphlet about Hadith, and because you're untrained, you're illiterate in that field, you've never read the classical text, you haven't even read the university literature on this topic, all you read is that pamphlet. Now that pamphlet will be very skillfully designed to be very colorful, very catchy, all of marketing and advertising and graphic design is in that pamphlet. But it's 10 pages. In 10 pages you can't understand anything. I'll give you another example. So my first degree was in political philosophy at the University of Chicago. Imagine I enter as a freshman and say, I want to write a paper saying I disagree with democracy. They say, you can't do that yet. You can't even make that decision yet. You must study all of classical political thought. You must study Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Machiavelli, medieval thought, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Tocqueville, contemporary thought. You must study all of them. Only when you've learned that, you've understood it, you write position papers on all those texts to show your appreciation of it, then at the end, as your crowning achievement, maybe in your senior year, your undergraduate thesis, you can write this topic, whether you agree or disagree with democracy or not. There's no way we will let you write that freshman year. That's called the academic-based approach. That's called the knowledge-based approach. So, do you understand the difference then between the ideology-based approach and the knowledge-based approach? Now, the problem is, is that the ideology-based approach is very, you know, you'd be surprised who's the most susceptible to falling into the ideology-based approach in Islamic scholarship, the educated Muslims. Why? Because they're what I call the educated, uneducated Muslims. They're educated in whatever their field of secular learning might be, political philosophy, engineering, medicine, journalism, whatever your field might be, but they're uneducated when it comes to Islam. So because they are educated, Normally, an educated person doesn't agree with something until they understand it. But because they're educated, they don't disagree off the bat either. But they forget that part. And they remember the first part that I don't agree with something until I understand it. They have no understanding whatsoever of classical Hadith scholarship, so they don't agree. So even though they're educated and academic and they follow the knowledge-based approach in their own individual field of learning, they end up in the ideology-based approach when it comes to the field of Islamic scholarship. And this is a big problem. It's a big problem. And then when you have ideologies, then Allah Akbar. Then you know ideologies never one. There's multiple ideologies. Let me now give you the second difference and the second line on the board between the knowledge-based approach and the ideology-based approach. Knowledge-based approach says that I will understand on the basis of ill. And ideology-based approach says I will understand on the basis of akal. Akal, what does it mean? That I will simply use my intellect. I will use my intelligence. I will use my reason to understand the matter. The knowledge-based approach says no. Mere reasoning, what in Arabic we call akal mahs mere reasoning is not sufficient to understand. Let me give you another example how the Western University follows the knowledge-based approach. So let's take for example, okay, I'll give you my own example. So in political philosophy, undergraduate degree, I took a couple of courses in economics. All right. Now imagine I get an invitation 
that, uh, well, I, I can't put it in the South African context, so I don't know. So imagine if I get an invitation from the state bank, right? And, or let's say, whatever you have, the Ministry of Planning or Ministry of Finance. And they're all holding a public session to discuss different tax models. Different tax models. And they had formed an expert committee, working group, that spent one year researching which tax models should be adopted in South Africa. All right, I go and I attend. I'm sitting there in the audience. The presenter, he presents. We looked at tax model one, option two, and option three. And they make a presentation, maybe like a 30-minute presentation. And then they say, and we decided to recommend tax model three. All right, now I'm sitting in the audience. I raise my hand. They say, yes. I say, you know, you're wrong. You should pick tax model one. So they say, your name? I say, Kamal Din Ahmed. They scroll down, Kamal Din Ahmed, Islamic history. They say, no. You're not qualified. I say, look, I'm intelligent. I know English. I fully understood your presentation. You're wrong. You have to pick tax model one. And you're saying you're picking tax model three. They will say, look, Kamal Din Ahmed, you're a really nice guy. We're very happy you came and attended our presentation today. But you don't even have a seat at the table. You're not even going to be sitting in the round table of experts. You're not even a member of this commission. Your opinion has no effect on our recommendation. Why? Because they say, Kamal Din Ahmed, you're a nice person. If you want to do this, you have to go back, get a PhD in economics, spend 10 years as a tax lawyer, spend 10 years in accounts and audits. You must have the requisite ilm. You must have that knowledge base. Without the knowledge, you will not be able to voice your opinion. It will not be considered. Similarly, if they're doctors, I'll give an example from physics. In physics, there are two theories of light. One is that light is made up of photons, particles called photons, the particle theory of light. And the second is the wave theory of light. Now you can see, I know a little bit of this by reading popular science books, right? Imagine there's a presentation at Harvard, and the physicists are getting together, and they're, they're experts in optics, and they're having this discussion that whether light is made of particles called photons or whether it is the wave theory of light. And I try to give my opinion. And I insist, I'm as intelligent as you, I have my IQ is the same as you, I'm, I'm using my reason. They will say, yes, you have a good, but you don't have ilm. You don't have the knowledge of physics. Right? Now, you know, the entire university system works this way. But what happens in the world of Islamic scholarship? What does the ordinary Muslim do? The Sirkai went to the presentation of an alim and he spoke for 20 minutes and he said that the scholars had difference of opinion and there was option one, option two, option three and I'm an intelligent person. After listening to that small 20 minute presentation, I've decided ruling three is the truth in Islam. And everybody who believes in ruling one and two is wrong. <laughs> That's ideology based approach. <laughs> ideology based approach. Just use your akal. Akal without ill or akal with a little ill. Knowledge based approach, ill. Obviously, you can't get ill unless you have an akal. So, ill through your akal. Here, it's akal without ill or akal with a little ill. So, that wouldn't work in the economics model, taxation, that wouldn't work in the physics model. If you had a knowledge based approach to Islamic scholarship, it wouldn't work in the field of Islamic studies either. Third difference between the knowledge based and ideology based approach. Ideology based approach says that. I am correct. Uh, maybe I can use another word for you. Only my position is valid and the others are invalid. So the ideology based person will always invalidate others, will always invalidate the other position. The knowledge based approach will say that I believe my position is correct, but I also believe others may be valid. Now I, I changed the word here correct and valid. I believe I'm correct, but I believe others might be valid. Let's go back to the university world. So when that presenter presents that he thinks light is made up of particles called photons, he thinks he's correct. Obviously, he genuinely thinks he's correct on the basis of his knowledge. But he's open to the fact that others may also have a valid position. His position does not necessitate the invalidation of other positions. That's called knowledge. And if your position necessitates the invalidation of everyone else, that's called ideology. Of course, knowledge has a certain limit. 
It doesn't mean that anything is valid. For example, in this particular model, there are only two possible valid answers that light are either particles or waves. You can't come up with a third position. All right? So there's some notion of plurality. It might be limited plurality, right? How would that plurality be assessed? In the knowledge-based world, that's called presenting your arguments, and that's called peer review, right? That's called peer review. So if a person presents their argument, let's say somebody writes an article, and he proposes it to a journal, and it goes for peer review, and no journal is willing to accept his article. So we will say, okay, and now we will view that position as not a valid position in economics, not a valid position in physics. And no one will publish it, and he won't be able to present it at a conference. And it's not because we're trying to restrict him. We gave him a chance. You write and you submit, and we will assess, and we will evaluate based on your reasoning and your arguments. But sometimes the scholarly community will make this decision, and it happens in every journal, in every field, every year, that this piece of writing does not... It was, does not constitute qualified scholarship in the field. Every field has certain standards. Certain standards. Islamic studies is going to be the same way. So in the knowledge-based approach, the same thing will apply. Any writing will be assessed on its arguments, reasonings, evidences, and if the peer review says that this is not a piece of qualified scholarship, that won't be accorded the valid level. But there will be sometimes multiple positions. So you may have multiple validity. The multiplicity of validity is possible and does actually happen in the knowledge-based approach. But in the ideology-based approach, the multiplicity of validity is absolutely impossible. Next difference between the knowledge-based approach and the ideal. Here, I think this is a lot because I want to show you this. This itself is a whole one-hour lecture of ours. There's a difference, but I think I've shown you enough between the knowledge-based approach and the ideology-based approach. So there was a very, if you would like to read another take on this, uh, these points aren't there, but there's another take on this. There was a white American convert by the name of Joseph Lombard, uh, L-U-M-B-A-R-D, and he did his PhD in Islamic studies at Yale. And he wrote a very interesting article called The Decline of knowledge and the rise of ideology in the modern Muslim world. Every word in that title is key. The decline of knowledge and the rise of ideology in the modern Muslim world. All right? So, I, I don't... We can pretty much find everything on Google. But there, this is something I wanted to show you. All of it. Now, let's look at a few verses from Quran. What does Allah SWT say in Quran? That this is a book, Quran al Kareem. There is no doubt, no confusion, no ambiguity in it whatsoever. That's how people normally translate this. Then, Hudallil Muttaqeen, it's a book that will guide the people of Taqwa. So, what does it mean? That. Uh, you know, Amr Shaikh have beautifully explained this in Urdu. I'm trying to translate that for you in English now. That if you have no crookedness in yourself, you will be able to stand that book which has no crookedness in it. But if you don't have taqwa, if you're not pure, sincere, true, honest, have other akhlaq, worship Allah Ta'ala, you're not true in every sense, you won't be able to get the full truth in the book. So actually it means that it's lare bafihi, for the people who themselves have no reib in them, have no delusion, no deception, no hypocrisy, that they say one thing, they do something else, they preach one thing, they do something else, they can never get the full guidance of Quran. They themselves have reib in them. Alright? Okay. Then, uh, <coughs> okay. Shara Ramadan zi unzila fihi al-Quran hudal lin nas. That the month of Ramadan is the month in which the Quran came was revealed. Hudal lin nas. So before Hudal lin muttaqeen. Here Hudal lin nas. This is what I told you that there's a level of bid'ah that every single person can get, can get from Quran, whether they have iman or not, whether they have taqwa or not. That's Hudal lin nas. That's a superficial level, level one. And there's a deeper level of bid'ah that you can only get if you're a person of taqwa. Now, what is the guidance that a person can get, any ordinary human being? So this is what Allah is saying, it contains in it bayyanat, clear markers, clear indicators. 
Babaynat uh, Minul Huda was Fulkan, clear indicators from guidance and the decisive criterion that will enable you to distinguish from Haq and Ba. Now that's an incredible thing that Allah Ta'ala enables the Quran to have this power to guide any human being, Nas, to be able to have Furqan to distinguish what is right and wrong. Or, now sometimes Allah Ta'ala addresses other communities asking them about their Aq. So this is a series of slides and I can just show you if you can you see this cursor. No, you can't. Okay. Just look at the end. Afala ta'ilun. So we put a series of slides to show you. So I'm going to show you a few verses and I'm going to make a statement now. The statement I'm about to make to you is absolutely verifiable. You can have a computer search of Quran. Whenever Allah Ta'ala says this ta'ilu, that do you not use your aql? Have you no sense? Have you no reason? Have you no intellect? Every time Allah Ta'ala says that, He's addressing unbelievers. So I'm going to show you a few verses, a sample, and you can check or search the Quran database and see the best for yourself. Why? Because after you have Iman, you're going to be using something other than your Akka. Then I'll show you those verses next. But before you have Iman, you're supposed to use your Akka. So here Allah Ta'ala asks the people of the book, right? That why do you argue about saying only Islam and the Torah and the Jail were not revealed until after him? Have you then no sense? Afala ta'ilun, afala ta'ilun. Then, and this might be a bit small for you to see, but if you can see the Arabic again, it ends here. Afala ta'ilu. Afala ta'ilu. So what does Allah Ta'ala say in the beginning? Wa idha tutla alayhim ayatuna. That when our clear ayat verses are recited to them, clearly. So again, the Quran is clear. But those who don't believe in meeting Allah SWT, because some of these people ask, ask this question, that if Allah Ta'ala said Quran is Hudal Linnas, then why don't atheists get guidance from Quran? Why don't atheist professors of Quranic studies in Western universities, so they know Quran, they read Quran, they teach Quran, why aren't they guided from it? So here Allah Ta'ala said, to be guided, you need to have another thing. You need to have another thing, what? And here is translated as belief, that actually, that they don't yearn to meet Allah. So this is part of the guidance, is your raja, means hope. You're hoping and yearning to meet Allah SWT. So they hear the Qur'an, but they don't have that yearning to meet Allah Ta'ala. So what do they do? They feel that the Qur'an is false. So this is the famous challenge that Allah Ta'ala gives in the Qur'an, that bring the Qur'an, the likeness to this, and it changes to etc. Et Alright? But here it's clear that this verse is talking to about those who don't believe. Allah Ta'ala ultimately then addresses them at the end. As in yesterday, I will leave this PowerPoint for you on the laptop, and you can get it uh, from the organizers and look at it and look up these verses in the tafsir and do more research on your own. Then when the Nabi Hud salam was sent to the people of Ad, again these were people who don't believe, people who don't believe, right? So again he's inviting them, worship Allah Ta'ala, believe in Allah Ta'ala, etc. And ultimately what does he tell them at the end? Same thing, afala ta'kilu. Again being addressed to people who don't yet have Iman or then again, Allah Ta'ala mentioning in Surah Yusuf about all the Anbiya who were sent before and they traveled, didn't knock the people, travel the land, get the signs. Again, ending what does Allah Ta'ala say? Again, addressing unbelievers. Afala ta'kudun. Will you still not then understand? Will you still not take heed? Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam said to his people who were also not believing, same thing at the end. Afala ta'kudun. Do you not then understand? Alright? Okay. Then, There is another word that sometimes Allah SWT uses, which is tatafakkaroon, yatafakkaroon, tafakku. So you can translate that as reflect, you can translate it as contemplate, you can translate it as ponder. So a couple of examples for that. That also is being said for unbelievers except one example, and that example is coming. Right? So here again, you have this that you should relate the signs and chronicles of the previous prophets to the people. La Allahum yatafakkarun, so that they may ponder. Again, unbelievers being asked to ponder and reflect. All right. We can skip this one. 
same thing here. Allah tells him that we were sent down the Quran to you and explain to the people and so that they may ponder. So these Ahl Kitab, the Jews, the Mushrikeen, everyone in that Arabian Peninsula, when they hear these recitations, they can ponder upon it. Sometimes some ulama have said that Ya'kulun, Ta'kulun is used for things around you and yet Tafakkurun is used for verses of Quran. But that is, you will see that uh, tafakkur is also used for reflecting on the creation around you. So what's the difference between ta'akkul and tafakkur? Ta'akkul means to try to use your rational intellect faculty in order to grasp and understand the reality of something. So what's the ultimate reality of the universe is the existence of Allah Ta'ala and that Allah Ta'ala is the creator. Tafakkur means not to use your rational intellect to understand something but something that your rational intellect has grasped now to ponder over it deeper and see what further understanding you can get from it. Does everybody catch that? That the akal is to catch it and initially grasp it and initially understand it. And then tafakkur means that which you have initially understood to try to reflect, ponder, contemplate so you can understand it deeply. Okay? So the reality is, and, and I don't have enough time, but like I said, I have, I'm leaving this with you. You will see that the akul and the fakur both have been used in Quran for non-believers. But the fakur, and in another word, the dabbur, has also been used for believers. So the ta'akul part, only for non-believers. And both the words are for the uh, fakur, and it's been used for both believers and non-believers. Why? So for the person who doesn't believe, so they're not imam. So the initial grasp of understanding can't come from the Qur'an and Sunnah because they don't believe in those things. So Allah says, okay, for you then, because you don't accept wahi and nabuwa, so your initial grasp of understanding ta'akul should be looking at the signs of Allah Ta'ala's creation around you. But for the believer, for the person who has imam, so he did his ta'akul by understanding the Qur'an and Sunnah. So he got initial grasp, he got the hudal and nas from Qur'an. Now he has to do tafakkur to dabbur and go deeper and deeper in understanding. Deeper and deeper in understanding. All right. Let me pause here maybe and explain this to you one more way for an example. So for the believer, it doesn't mean the believers don't use akul, don't get me wrong. But for the believers, the akul is a tool. And for the non-believer, the akul is a source of knowledge. For the believer, it's a tool. So I'll give you an example. So let's say somebody has perfect vision. Right? Perfect vision. So that's a tool to see. However, you will not be able to see no matter how perfect your vision is unless there's light. Without, in the complete absence of light, complete absence of light, you will not be able to see anything no matter how perfect your vision is. So the tool alone is not enough. That's what it means to be a tool. Just like that, the akal of insan is like eyesight. But the believer can only progress when he uses that. In fact, the human can only progress when he uses that in the nur of the Qur'an and Sunnah, in the nur of wahi and nabu, if they exercise the akal in the light of revelation and prophet. All right? Okay. Mm. Here, here comes again, wala ya'kirun. And I, just, yeah, I put this slide just to show you. Sometimes Allah Ta'ala asks, they're going to be a verse like, Afala ta'kilun. That do you not understand? Afala ya'kilun. Did they not understand? It's a rhetorical question, right? Sometimes Allah Ta'ala says it as a statement. Wala ya'kilun. And they don't understand. And they don't have sense. Now what does that mean? So if you ask a modern neuroscientist, they say, of course that this person has an uncle. Of course this atheist is intelligent. Richard Dawkins has an uncle. What do you mean, wala ya'kilun? Allah Ta'ala is saying, Wala yaqilu, right? So the reason I put this here for you is even the Quranic understanding of that akal and mahz, of that mere intellect, is not the modern, Weberian, Western sense of rationality or the empirical, scientific paradigm of rationality. Because otherwise, you can't negate that. You can't negate that under what Allah Ta'ala is saying, Wala yaqilu. He's negating their faculty of akal. That you can't negate their neurological, neuroscientific, Weberian, rational sense. Of course they have it. Richard Dawkins has that akal. So it means Allah Ta'ala's usage even of akal in Qur'an. It means the understanding that leads to imam. That's why it's like, wala yaqil. Otherwise, of course they understand. The atheist professor understands all of this. The atheist professor may be an expert in Arabic grammar and linguistics. Wala yaqilun. But he doesn't understand. 
doesn't have sense. All right. <coughs> Here I told you the example I wanted to show you that the fakr is used for non-believers. So here Allah SWT says, but tilka al but tilka al thal. That these are examples, similes, parables Allah Taala coined in Quran. Nadir bahul bin nas that we coined and established them for all people. So that includes non-believers. Why? La Allahum yatafakkuru. So that they may ponder. So what Allah Taala is saying is that okay, if your akal isn't powerful enough to initially grasp. I'll think, I will explain to you in Quran, this Barhud al nas I will explain to you the parables, stories, similes, likenesses. So it comes in your first grasp. It comes in your first. Allah tells us that the aql part for you. Through this explanation, through, parallel, through parallels and similes. But now, yatafakkurun, you'll still have to go deep and reflect on it if that parable will lead you to imam. And if you don't do that tafakkur, you might get that example from Quran, but it won't lead you to imam. Oh, now comes the second part that I told you that the believer, <coughs> the believer is an altogether different world. Not the akul. Why? Because the function of hidayah for the believer, the guidance of a believer, guidance, hidayah does not come under akul. Look, at, look here for a moment. Guidance does not come under akul. Guidance comes under kal. Guidance comes on the spiritual heart. Proof from Quran. وَمَن يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ And whomsoever has iman in Allah يَهْدِ قَلْبُهُ Allah is not, not sending hidayah in the aql anymore. That was before iman. Anybody who takes iman, who has iman, and there's no other condition men, mentioned here. وَمَن يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ وَعَمَلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا No. Whoever has iman, Allah Ta'ala sends hidayah on their qalb of their heart. So now their understanding is not from the mind. The Ahl Iman al Ladina Amanu's understanding is from their heart. Then Allah Ta'ala makes it clear that yes, even though I'm going to give these Al Ladina Amanu Hidayah in their heart, but still at Allah Allah alone, Wallahu bi kulli shayin alim, it's indeed Allah alone who has knowledge about everything. And another way you can understand this feeling that Allah Ta'ala that Allah Ta'ala who has knowledge about everything, who has knowledge that your uncle could never reach, that Allah Ta'ala is going to send hidayah, but not on your uncle, on your heart. Another example that's not a side that I have here for you, but Allah Ta'ala says in Quran, Allam al insana ma lam ya'lam. Allam al insan, Allah Ta'ala teaches humanity, ma lam ya'lam, that which they never knew and they never could have known. Why? They don't have a brain? They have a brain. Allah Ta'ala is saying, Allah Ta'ala is going to give you ill that your brain, your mind, your rational intellect, your uncle could never have ascertained on its own. So that's another type of knowledge. And that's a higher source of knowledge. That's a higher source of knowledge. If you want, just to maybe you might enjoy this, Imam al Ta'ala has outlined a beautiful epistemology where he explains this. And what he says is that epistemology is false of knowledge, right? There's things that you know, objects of knowledge, and then there's the ways that you know them. How did you get to know them? So the varai, the, the ways of knowing, and the things that you know. Oh. So the first way of knowing is your five senses. Fine. And through your five senses, you know many things. You know something is hard, you know something is soft, you know something is cool, you know something is, you know something is hot, etc. Second source of knowledge is your akal. Right? Through your rational, deliberative faculty, you can know things. For example, let's say none of you have ever been to New York, right? So what does that mean? Your five senses have never experienced New York. You've neither seen it or heard it or smelt the smells. Yeah, I can tell you uh, some smells in Manhattan. How I grew up because so many dogs. Yeah, so you've never seen it and you've not heard it and you haven't smelt it, you haven't touched it, you haven't tasted it. But you know it exists at the same level of yakin that I do. I can't tell you, you know, I was born and raised here, I know more. I may know about New York, but the fact that New York exists, you're equal to me in that. How did you become equal to me in that when your five senses have never experienced it? Because of your akal. Because of your akal. Through your akal, you know that it exists. Alright? So one source of knowledge, five senses, certain knowables. Second source of knowledge, your akal, certain knowables. But the third thing, he works it the other way around. He says there's a third type of knowable. A third claimant to knowledge that you could have never acquired through your five senses 
and you could have never acquired through your aql. And he says, that is wahi in the book. So he asks, it's just a challenge to the atheist in one of his works. He says, look, if you don't believe it, try it. He says, take any verse of Quran and take any hadith. He says, take anything. And take a verse in hadith that you say this, the rational mind could never have come to this on its own. And he says, you do knowledge by experience. You practice it and experience it. And he gives an example. One example he gives is a hadith to the Prophet wasallam that if you make <coughs> pleasing Allah Ta'ala, if you make pleasing Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala your primary worry and concern, then Allah Ta'ala will remove all of your worldly worries and concerns. And this is not a statement that the five senses could ever arrive at. This is also not a statement that can be proved through logic or demonstration or any type of empirical means. Right? So, Imam Azai says, for this type of thing, you try it. You practice it. You actively do that. And if you find that that's the case, if you say that, yes, I did this, I made pleasing Allah Ta'ala my primary concern, and now all my worldly concerns have gone away, so now you know this statement of knowledge is true. If the statement of knowledge is true, the source of that knowledge must necessarily be true. And because the source of that statement of knowledge could be neither the five senses nor the akal, therefore there must be some other source of knowledge. That source of knowledge is Allah. So this is where Imam Ghazali then explains this. Over. So where does that take place? That takes place in your heart. Your heart will know it. But what does it mean? Even when you experience this, even when you do this, like that hadith, if you do this, if you make pleasing Allah Ta'ala your primary concern, and then you find that all your worries go away. So the certainty doesn't come in your mind. The yateen comes in your heart. Oh. Then Allah Ta'ala talks about those who don't believe. I'm sure there's a couple of words missing here that's important. If you get this presentation, slide number 16. It's not an error. There's, there's no mistake, but it should actually say, Luhum kulubun. So Luhum is missing from the beginning. Luhum kulubun ya'idun biha. Allah tells us that if only they had hearts, ya'iduna biha, that they understood from their hearts. Allah is addressing the unbelievers. How could they have had imam? Allah is saying only they had had hearts that they understood from their hearts. So the feeling of ta'akul, understanding, is transferred to the heart if you have imam. And Allah is saying if they had done that, they would have had imam. All right. If you're interested in this more, Imam al Ghazali al Tayyan is Ihya al Muddim, which has been translated in English. He has one book. Uh, I think in English the person, it's called Kitab Ajayb al Kalb in Arabic. I think it's been translated in the book of the marvels of the heart. And he talks about the difference between Akul and Kalb, and you can read more about that over there. Last one thing I wanted to show you in terms of this faculty is there's another term Allah Ta'ala uses in Quran that's called the Lub. Lub. So the people who have lub, they're called ulul albab. Ulul albab, lub. Now, we put these two words here, wisdom, discernment. It's very hard to find a precise English word that translates lub. So because of that, then I put a few verses for you where Allah Ta'ala Himself describes uh, <coughs> the characteristics of the people who are ulul albab. And then Allah Ta'ala describes in Quran from whom He expects from whom he has this expectation that they will use their lubna, all right? Their faculty of inner, of inner perception and deep wisdom and discernment. All right. So first Allah Ta'ala, يُعْتِذْ هِكْمَةً مَنْ Allah Ta'ala gives wisdom to whomsoever he wants. So that's clear then from Quran. There's some type of hikmah, some type of wisdom that is given by Allah. And obviously a person can't entertain it, if you could get it by yourself, so you say, Allah, you give it to whoever you want, but I can get it anyway because I'm a university graduate. Huh? No, no, no. This is a hikmah that you can't get. This is a hikmah that nobody can get. It's not in your ability to acquire. This is a hikmah that can only be bestowed by Allah Ta'ala on the heart of a person. And He establishes by fact that He gives it, yutit hikmata, and He establishes by fact in God, He gives it to some people, whomsoever He wants, man yasha. So there are people like that in this ummah. So there's, there's not some parity, this constant misconception that everybody's at the same level. No. There are people who have hikmah bestowed by Allah and there are people who don't. It's a Quranic fact. 
<coughs> oh. Then Allah says, "Mamay yuta mamay yuta hikma." Whomsoever has been bestowed upon, bestowed this hikma upon them, so hud udia khairan kathira. They have been given a tremendous khair, tremendous thing. So what does it mean? It's not a small difference. Allah is saying in the Quran, khairan kathira. It's a huge difference between that person who has not been given this hikma by Allah Taala and that person who has been given this hikma. Allah Taala is established in the Quran. All right. Okay. Now who are these people? Mama yadakru illa ulul albab. But they won't understand this unless they're ulul albab, people of deep perception, deep understanding. Next verse: What the kuni ya ulul albab? Ulul albab. What are you supposed to do? So the unbelievers are being told: Use your akal to have iman. The people of iman are being told: Have to fakur, have to dabar to get hadaya. And the people of ulul albab are being told: You go straight for dakh. Because the hikmah has been given to you by Allah Ta'ala. You have the love from Allah Ta'ala. So now your job is what? That you've been given this wisdom by Allah Ta'ala. To do what? You have one job. What taku ni? Allah Ta'ala is saying that you must fear me. Hmm? Some preachers have wondered about, okay, I think I will just read the headings out to you and you can read these verses later. But same thing, ittakullahi ulul albab. Fear Allah Ta'ala, those who have ibab. Who are they? Alladhina amanu. Alladhina amanu. So clear that lub can never be given to somebody who is not a believer. And the believer who is given it, his job again is taqwa. Then Allah Ta'ala addresses them. Then andalallahu ilaykum. Zikra. Indeed Allah Ta'ala sent to you, O people, ulul albab, a zikra, a reminder of Qur'an. So they get a deeper understanding of Qur'an. They get a deep understanding of Qur'an. Not because of the national intelligence, but because of the hikmah and the love that Allah Ta'ala bestowed upon them. <coughs> Here's a long verse where Allah Ta'ala mentions several characteristics. And at the end says, وَأُولَاكَ هُمْ أُولُوا الْأَلْبَعُ And these people, who, and you can just read it in English while I talk, the people who have all these things, they are the أُولُوا الْأَلْبَعُ So what does it mean when the ability to understand the Qur'an properly depends on these things? They abstain from worshipping. Tahut means they abstain from worshipping and giving into shameless, immodest trends in society. They abstain from fitna. They abstain from false ideology. Right? So, khair. Oh. Next is that they make the zikr of Allah Ta'ala. They make the zikr of Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala. Right? So I told you that verse was coming with the fuckers for the believers. Here it is. This is the verse that they do. Right? <coughs> <coughs> so first, uh, in, in the night and the days, in the ayat in the ulu al-bab, there are signs for the people of ulu al-bab. Who are they? Al-ladina yadkuroon Allah, yamun ulu wa ala jinubihim. The ulu al-bab are the people of dhikr. So the people of iman, the people of taqwa, and the people of dhikr, and the people of hikmah. They remember Allah Ta'ala standing, sitting, lying on their sides. And, so it's not just plain tafakkur. Having love and having dhikr, then again they reflect. We are the fakkaruna fi halki samawat wal ard, and they reflect on the creation of their love in the heavens and earth. That's a much higher level of creation, higher level of reflection, because they're doing it being ulul alba. So that's when they do that. They reflect that Ya Allah, indeed, we proclaim that you have not created any of this in vain. What does it mean that even then, with all of their iman, lub, zikr, taqwa, they might still not perceive every understanding. But they know that even if we can't perceive it, Ya Allah, you have not created anything. There is a purpose to your creation. Despite us being ulul albab, we not, might not be able to perceive that purpose, but we know everything you do has purpose in it. That's called wisdom. That's called wisdom. All right? Then, the word ulama. It should also be clear. The word ulama is in Qur'an. Now, sometimes you will find some people, they like to say, there is no such thing as clergy in Islam. That is correct. There is no such thing as clergy in Islam. But to translate that as there is no such thing as ulama in Islam, that's profoundly wrong. That's against Qur'an. And you cannot even disbelieve in one verse in Qur'an. Clergy means when people used to say this sentence, <coughs> with proper understanding, is that Allah Ta'ala has mentioned, and you have the slide in front of you, Allah Ta'ala has mentioned that there are ulama in Islam. 
But the role of ulama in Islam is not what the role of the Catholic clergy was in Catholicism. The role of the Catholic clergy in Catholicism was that they presented themselves as intermediaries between man and God. Hence, you want to do Tawbah, you have to go to them and sit in a booth next to them in the church and confess to them. No, no, ulama, you can't, you must make Tawbah to Allah Ta'ala. You can't beg me for forgiveness. You have to beg Allah Ta'ala for forgiveness. Right? That's all it means. So never be fooled by these catchphrases. Because sometimes people use this. This is also what we call intellectual dishonesty. To take this statement, there is no such thing as clergy in Islam, but to say that with the intent to convince people that there is no concept of scholars in Islam. When the word scholars, al-ulama, is in Qur'an al karim So what Allah is saying, إِنَّمَا يَقْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ إِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَا The ibad means the worshippers of Allah Ta'ala. So it means to be an alam, you must first have worship. To be an alam, you must have first worship. And min, if you remember yesterday, I explained to you, min comes from tabib. Min means some. So there's first from all of humanity, there are those who are ibad, ibadullah, those who worship Allah Ta'ala. From amongst them, there will be another subset called al-ulama. Alright? All right. Allah Ta'ala then also explains in the Quran, Kul, hal can those who have knowledge, ilm, ever be considered equal to those who don't have knowledge? The answer is no. It's a rhetorical question, but it means no. Allah Ta'ala is declaring in the emphatic form that the answer is no. So what does it mean? Allah Ta'ala is also telling us in Quran to follow what I told you earlier, is the knowledge-based approach. That it's ilm that makes a difference. It's ilm that makes a difference. And then, again you see it again, إِنَّمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ أُولُ الْأَلْبَابِ I've already explained to you the concept of أُولُ الْأَلْبَابِ Alright? So what does it mean in then? The أُولُ الْأَلْبَابِ will understand that the ulama and non-ulama are different in their rank in front of Allah. But the, somebody who is not ulul al-bab, he won't understand this point. Point. There, these are some of the things I did with you yesterday. I think we're going to stop over here. Alright? There were a few slides from yesterday that I was not able to complete. Uh, but uh, I actually, that PowerPoint was on a different USB. You might have it here on the, should be here because I did say it at that time. Since you're 10 or 15 minutes left, I might just finish that real quick. Yeah. Okay. I just finished it when the Alright. So I think we have gotten pretty much up to. In case some of you weren't here, yesterday's presentation was about spirituality, and there we talked towards the end about the people of spirituality, and one of that was about the Allah. Right? So I'm just changing topics here, right? Uh, but up to now we were talking about knowledge, ilm, akal, tafakkur, tadabbur, lub, ulama. And now to go back to the concept that we mentioned yesterday, we were talking about awliya ulama. So there are one or two hadith uh, that I wanted to show you. Maybe I can actually, so we don't do too much, I'll just show you one verse. I'm thinking what to show you. Allah, but this is the beauty of being, you know, it's the same position, huh? How can you be in a position to select what verse to tell people? Huh? We want to feed you everything. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Hmm? It's a strange position to be in. Huh? Here, I, will, I, will, I just tell you parts of these verses in the day. So this is a long day, and again you have this presentation here and you're welcome to take it. This is a hadith from the Sahih of Imam Bukhari and Allah Ta'ala. Long hadith about the gatherings of zikr. The interesting part here is that the summary of the hadith is Allah Ta'ala sends His mercy on these gatherings. Allah Ta'ala accepts their prayers for Jannah. He accepts their prayers for forgiveness. So then one angel tells Allah Ta'ala that Ya Allah, sitting in that gathering there is one person, if you want to see it here in the hadith, Yakulu malakum min malaika. One angel from all of the angels says to Allah Ta'ala, quote, Fihim fulanun. That in this group of people making zikr, there is so and so person. Laysa minhum. And he is not from them. 
when he's not really a lover of Allah Ta'ala, he didn't really come to do zikr. So why did he come? So the angel says, Inna ja'a That indeed he came for a haja. He came due to some worldly need. He came, he was having a problem in business, he was having a problem with the children, he was having a problem in marriage, he couldn't get married. And they, he or she thought that, okay, I will go sit in this gathering of zikr. And when they make dua to Allah Ta'ala, asking, Ya Allah, give us more love for you, grant us jannah, make us true, grant us haya. I will sit there and make dua, Ya Allah, grant me wives, grant me husband. Right? Allah Akbar. That's what the Prophet was saying, that he came for hajjah. He came for worldly need. So this angel tells Allah Ta'ala this. Angel means that, Ya Allah, you shouldn't forget that person, because he wasn't there for the right reason. Oh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says to that angel, and the Prophet is sharing this with us. And this is the Sahih Bukhari. Humul Jalasa'u. That no, no, no. These are such people that when they sit and they worship and remember me, La Yashka Bihim Jalisuhum. That anybody who sits with them cannot be deprived of my mercy. That this is the value of the people of Zikr, the gatherings of Zikr. This is a hadith indicating how much we need to get this company and get this benefit. And the last thing then is about Tawbah. Alright? <coughs> so Allah Ta'ala, so this is big, you will be able to see that. Why can't you see that? Now you can see it. I'm showing this, but there's not that. I'll tell you verbally and you can trust me on it because you have the, you have the presentation here. Allah tells us in the Quran, Tubu ilallahi jiriya, ayyuhal mu'minun, la'allakum tuflihu. I think you can see it now. Tubu ilallahi, you can see it now. Wa tubu ilallahi jiriya, make tawbah to Allah Ta'ala all together. Ayyuhal mu'minun, all believers. La'allakum tuflihu, so that you may be successful in tawbah. So there's a notion here also back to the spirituality topic that one way to increase in your spirituality with Allah Ta'ala that Allah mentioned in the Quran is called Tawbah. Tawbah means to beg forgiveness for his sins and make a sincere commitment in the future that you never want to return again. Tawbah means to make a plea in your heart that Allah Ta'ala removes anything in your heart that is displeasing to him. One way to make Tawbah is to go to the people of spirituality. So this is a hadith in Sahih Muslim. And okay, maybe we just do this in English. So there was a person, he killed 99 people. Alright? And then he went to a monk and he asked him, Can I make Toba? The monk said, You can't make Toba. So he ends up killing the monk also. Then he goes to an alim and says, I killed 100 people. Is there anyone that will accept my Toba? And so the alim says, Yes. He says, Yes. And then again, at least if nothing else for our own enjoyment, we're going to mention to you, What did the alim say? Fakal al na'am. Yes, of course you can make Toba. Yes, you can be forgiven by Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. يَهُوا لُبَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ التَّوْبَةِ And who is there and what is there that can come between you and your Tawbah? So he got happy and said, Okay, how do I make Tawbah? So the Alam told him, إِن تَلِقْ إِلَىٰ أَرْضٍ كَذَا وَكَذَا That you must leave and go from what this city to this town to that town. Why? فَإِنَّ بِهَا أُنَاسًا فَإِنَّ بِهَا أُنَاسًا يَعْبُدُونَ اللَّهِ that there in that town, there are some people, they worship Allah Ta'ala. Fa'budullah ma'ahum. You, you go worship Allah Ta'ala with them. You go worship Allah Ta'ala with them. Alright? So, here you can see that. Alright? And don't come back because this is a place where you killed a hundred people and this is not a good place for you. Alright? Then to make this next part short, he passes away and he dies along the way. And he had barely covered half the distance. Then the angels come, one angel comes which is going to take the roof to Jahannam. Then the other angel comes which takes the roof for Jannah. And they disagree with each other. So Allah Ta'ala sends another angel in the form of a human being to decide between them. That angel says, okay, what will you do? We will measure the distance. Was he closer to that town where he killed the hundred people? Or did he die closer to that town where there were people who were worshipping Allah Ta'ala, spiritual people, and he was going to go join them in their worship to Allah Ta'ala, hoping that that would make Allah Ta'ala forgive him. 
So when they mapped him and they measured it, they found him near to the land of the place where he was going to make Toba. Katada, if you know Katada is one of the great Taba Tabi. He said that Hassan, Hassan is Hassan al Basri, Imam Talaman, the great Tabi. The Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim often give their comments on the Hadith. Alright? <coughs> Told him that it was said to them. So Hassan al Basri said that it was said to him. This in Hadith science is known that he's saying that a Sahaba said to him, but he doesn't give the name of Sahaba. Right? So he said that it was said to him that as death approached that person, he started crawling. Which is mean? So he must have been walking. He was the true seeker of Toba. He wanted to go to that place where there were these pious people and worship Allah and Allah Allah with them. Then he must have fallen sick. Then he must have started stumbling. Then he must have fallen more sick. Then he must have realized he was dying. Then he must have stopped, but he really wanted to reach. So he started crawling, crawling, crawling to make Toba, and death overcame him when he was crawling. Allah Akbar. And Allah Ta'ala forgave him. So what does it mean? He didn't even reach those people. He didn't even reach that place. But he had niyyah. He had intention. So this was the last thing we were going to tell you yesterday, that spirituality, the journey to spirituality, begins <coughs> just on intention. Begins just by making intention. And the journey to knowledge is very simple. Right? So that's something you can do today, if you wish. We can't instantly become people of immense spirituality. We can't instantly get intense knowledge. But niya and dua, that's something you can do in one gathering, in one session, in one lecture, in one moment. You can make a niya irada in your heart. That, Ya Allah, I also want this taqwa and haya and zikr and wilaya that we showed you in yesterday's presentation. And Ya Allah, I also want this ilm and qalb and your hidayah in my heart. And I also want to be from ulul al-bab. And I want that hikmah that you send. And I want that level of knowledge. I want hudad al muttaqeen I want to make myself muttaqeen So whatever hidayah you put in Quran that is from muttaqeen I want that hidayah also. That should be your intention. That should be your prayer. That is certainly our intention and prayer for you. And that is why we came to sit with you. May Allah Ta'ala accept your coming. May He accept your sitting. May He make each and every one of us people of spirituality and people of knowledge in our deen. Wa akhirat da'wana. Alhamdulillah.